turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Hopefully you brought your Bible. If you didn't, uh, hopefully you grabbed a bulletin when you came in. And on the back side of the bulletin is a spot to take notes. I don't know about you, but I need multiple forms of engaging with a topic in order to retain anything. So this is what, this is my way of doing this. Hopefully it's helpful to you. But uh, we are in our third week now uh, of this series called Authentic. And we are getting in and exploring these things where, where there's areas of our lives that we hide from God. Areas that we, we put on masks and we pretend to be something different. And I firmly believe that when we walk in the freedom that God offers, we don't have to be fake. We don't have to muster our way through things. God gives us um, the ability to be genuine and authentic and real with people. And that is the be- absolute best place to find ourselves. So I would like you to join me in participating a little bit this morning. And uh, I need you to be very honest. Be very, very honest. Who in this room would say that at one point in your life, you were caught in a lie? Raise your hand if at some point in your life, you were caught in a lie. Now keep your hands up. Look around. Look around at all the hands that are up. Look specifically at who doesn't have their hand up. Okay. You've just been caught in a lie. Okay. Or you're really, really, really good at telling lies. I'm not sure which one's better. Okay. You can put your hands down. And some of you are just like, I'm just keeping my hand up the whole time. <clears throat> yeah, we've been, we've been caught. Because we, for some reason, we felt the need to. So um, what pushes us to that? What pushes us to do things that we know are wrong and then to cover them up by telling a lie? Now, I'm going to be very honest. Um, I've told lies. And, right, you're like, oh, my goodness, no way. Um, <laughs> I know a shocker for all of you here. Uh, but, uh, and to my wife. And I know she's caught me, and, and specifically, <laughs> one particular thing, when I was in the military, when we did laundry, okay, we would take our camel uniform, our utilities, our BTUs, or whatever you want to call them, and we would go out to this concrete sink, and we would add, put a little detergent on them, and we'd scrub them right there on the concrete, okay, and that's how we did our laundry. So, and when we cleaned the bathrooms, we used Windex. It fixed everything. It cleaned everything. And the guys are like, the military guys are like, yeah. Well, but that doesn't translate well with my wife and our home laundry. Um, don't clean with Windex and do our clothes right. So in other words, she basically asked me not to do laundry. Every once in a while, though, she'll say, Honey, would you th- throw this load in or would you transfer this over to the dryer? And there's been many a times when she says, where I say, Oh, yeah, I'll do that. And then later on in the day, she's still gone. She says, Hey, by the way, did you move that over? I'm like, going, No, I didn't, but I'm not going to tell you that. Of course I did. Who do you think I am? Of course I did. As I'm running downstairs to quick put it in the washing machine or in the dryer. And I know that she knows how to read my voice. And I know that she has caught me not always being honest. So we get, and any guys know what I'm talking about. Your wife said do something. You said you did it knowing that you didn't, but you're hoping to get it done before she got home. Right? (laughs) Guys are like, I don't know if I want to raise my hand. Trust me, guys, by the end of this message, I pray you want to raise your hand. Okay? But we get caught. When we sin, it's so easy and so tempting to try to cover it up with a lie. Almost every one of you in this room said you've done it. So we're tempted to, isn't it? It's easy. It's easy to go down that road. We sin, then we cover it up. We sin, then we cover it up. We sin, then we cover it up. Okay? And it's so easy to get stuck in that. We see that with, with Adam and Eve. In the garden, and Satan's tempting Eve, and, and, and she, she takes a bite, and she goes to Adam, and he takes a bite, and then God's walking, and he's like, hey guys, where are you? They were hiding from God, right? The cover-up. We're hiding from God, and they literally did cover up. And, and, they, and God's like, what happened? And Adam's like, it's her fault. And what does she say? It's Satan's fault. And what does Satan say? Well, he, he couldn't say much because he didn't have a leg to stand on. 
Oh, some of you got it. I had to. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> uh, another story that we read, <laughs> don't worry, this one doesn't end like that, uh, is Cain and Abel in the Bible. We read about Cain and Abel, right? And they're both offering, and, and, and Cain's wasn't considered uh, as worthy as Abel, so Cain kills Abel, and then God's, God comes and confronts him and says, hey, where's your brother? And what does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? You know, and he's hiding this thing, and he, and he covers it up with a lie. And then we also read about Joseph, and, and he was a young guy, and he had these dreams, right? And he goes and runs his mouth to his dad and his brothers, and they got really angry at him. So there, he goes and brings lunch to them one day, and they beat him up and throw him in a pit. And they end up, instead of murdering him, they sell him off, but they go and they tell dad, sorry, your son is dead. He was killed by a wild animal. And they use his code as proof. Once again, sin and cover it up. We see it over and over throughout Scripture. And we see it in our lives. And why, why do we do that? Why do we feel the need to live covered up? Live with these masks. Do, do one thing and say another. You know, I wish that I had just been more honest with my wife and said, no, dear, I didn't do it. But I will, <laughs> you know. But we need, feel the need to cover these things up. So the thing is, after we sin, after we do something wrong, we have two choices. And now some of you in this room are like, oh, I'm, not a, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> if, you, if you're saying that right now in your heart, okay, this is what you're doing. Is you're calling God a liar, okay? And if, you, if, you, if you're like, where did you get that? Read 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have not sinned, we are making God out to be a liar. Just look that up for yourself, okay? That one isn't in your notes. That's just free for the day. Um, but this message is going to be a little hard, okay? And I'm probably going to move through it real quick because God was doing some good things. We wanted to hear some testimonies today of good things that were happening in our church and, and, some, and to hear from the kids and to see that stuff. But... <clears throat> So we're going to probably move through this quick, so you'll need to keep up. But this message is going to be hard, okay? So if, you, if, if you're ready to hear something hard and challenging that could affect your life at many different levels, then I'd encourage you to say this right now, smack it to me. Okay, okay. We're going we're gonna to say, say it again. Smack it to me, Pastor. <clears throat> okay, just you said it, so we're going to do it, Okay. <laughs> You have two options. And the first, after you sin, you have two choices. One is to conceal your sins. You can conceal it, which we've all tried. And who in this room you'd say, epic fail at my attempt to conceal? Okay? Now you notice there's less hands up. So either you were slow to respond, right? Or <clears throat> you were actually really good at concealing it. Sorry. I wish you weren't so good at concealing it. It's because it says actually here in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, he who conceals his, conceals his sins, what does it say there? Does not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them, say this aloud, finds mercy. What is it? That whoever confesses and renounces them, what? Finds mercy. I don't want you, but that's where I want to be. I don't want to be sitting around not prospering. But today, many of you stand at a crossroads. There's things in your life that you've been hiding, that you've been covering up, and, and you will be confronted with those things, I believe, and I pray that you will during this time today, because God loves you, okay? And, and he wants better things for you. But you're, you're going to have a choice when the Holy Spirit begins to bring things to the forefront of your mind, and you're like, oh yeah, that thing. You're going to have a choice on how you respond to that. How you deal with that. When, you know you, when you're doing something that you know is wrong. And most of us have been there. You go into a situation, you're like, I know I shouldn't do this. Or you find yourself looking at something or doing something and you're like, I need to stop. Your brain's saying, I need to stop. I need to stop doing this. And yet you keep going there and doing that. Been there? You know what I'm talking about? Right? It's hard sometimes. And, and it's so easy to just conceal it. But when we conceal it, we don't prosper. We suffer more harm, but today I challenge you to drop that mask and to genuinely be authentic. Confess it, find healing, and find mercy. And you confess it to somebody that you can trust. So you can either conceal your sins or you can confess your sins. What are you going to do? Which one is more freeing? Obviously, when you don't have to make up lies 
to cover up lies and living that, down that path, it's so much easier to walk in the truth. Or like we sang at the beginning of our, of our service today, I want to be in the light. Amen? So, 2 Samuel, hopefully you turn there, chapter 11. We're looking at King David and an issue that, that he dealt with. And many of you are probably familiar with this story, and some of you aren't. So King David, you might know parts of it. Uh, well, let's, let's just read this here. And it says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David, King David, sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, is this a big deal to see a beautiful woman in itself? No. Okay? You, you see it. You're, you're walking along, and, and you see, you see this, this scene. This, well, here's this woman. She's naked. Okay, now revert my eyes. I'm going to go about doing something else. In itself, is it, is, it wrong? is it a sin to be tempted? No, it's not. And some of you need to receive that this morning. Just because certain things cross through your mind and you're tempted towards a certain direction, that in itself is not a sin. What David does next is when it becomes, begins to become a problem. See, the, the Hebrew word that's translated when he saw her is the word raw. Everybody say the word raw. Raw, okay? And, and it means to look and to look intensely. So he didn't just see, he didn't just say, oh, wow, pretty woman, and, 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 and go on about his business, like, dude, somebody needs to get her a wall, right? <clears throat> he saw her, and then he looked intensely. So he didn't go, ah. He's like, ooh, she looks really good. She looks really good. Wow, she looks good, right? And, and, and it wasn't just like a raw, it was like, Raw, right? <laughs> so he took it to another level. This word is talking about a looking and looking intently. So it wasn't a sin to be to look initially. It's what happened and what he did with it next that became the issue. And it says, and David sent someone to find out about her. So he saw, and then he started taking action. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. Imagine when David got that text. <laughs> oh, no. You imagine that, and oh boy, here it begins. Here begins the lie. Here begins the cover-up. Or here comes the confession. And what did David choose? He chose to start the lies. And it changed the course. In fact, you could say that the whole tragic story of David is summarized in five verses. And sadly, for many of us, the tragedy of the sins that we've covered up or the sins that we've concealed will cost you way more than you could ever imagine and could one day be summarized in just a couple of sentences. You know, my dad, he... Or my mom, she, or my wife, she, or my husband, he, well, this person I looked up to, he, and then something comes after that which summarizes your life. We call it your epitaph. Something's carved on, on your headstone. This sums up their life. And what you end up with in those cases is how you chose to respond when you had opportunity or you even did something wrong. Did you choose to confess or did you choose to conceal? And we see what happens with David, summed up in just a couple of verses. And many of you, when you think of King David, you, you think of this story of Bathsheba and this ma a major sin, and yet this is the man that the Bible actually says this is a man after God's own heart. Wait a minute. He just committed adultery... And then he's going to, as we see in just a little bit, he's going to start covering this up. So how did this happen? How did this guy who once killed a lion, killed a bear, killed Goliath, and now he's hiding this sin? So how did he get here? First of all, we notice that King David was not where he was supposed to be. Where was he supposed to be? He was supposed to be off at war. It's time for kings to be at war right now. He was not where he was supposed to be. He took his responsibilities 
And men, and this is especially for you, when we as men, as the spiritual leads of our home, when we fail and we stop doing our duty, it puts us in a compromising position. And we need to be where men need to be. Okay? Not sure where that came from, but it wasn't in my notes. <laughs> that, somebody here needed to hear that. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And then he ended up seeing something he wasn't supposed to see, which led him to do something he wasn't supposed to do, which ended up costing him way more than he ever intended. And the reason is because we are vulnerable to a type of sin that the Bible calls the lust of the flesh. We're susceptible to that. Now, if you're a Christian, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. And yet, our, we are now alive spiritually. We were once dead in sin, now we are alive in Christ. But we still live in this thing called the flesh. This stuff. And it's a, it's a bummer sometimes. It's a struggle sometimes. Amen? There's some challenges that it brings. But there, there are different types of sin. Uh, and there's, uh, but they are all sin. But we, and we live in a culture that does not want to call things that are sin, sin, don't we? We make all kinds of excuses and justifications for it. But there is an ongoing battle in our life. Because, you are, because we are Christians, we're connected to God. We're connected with the Spirit, but we still battle in the flesh. In fact, it says in Galatians 5.17, it says that, and this one isn't in your notes, this is just once again free of charge. Uh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Do I just do whatever I want? It's not the best thing for me. I want to do what God wants. His plan is the best. So on a good day, your spirit leads you and you're doing what pleases God, right? And we have those days. Like, man, this was a great day. I read my devotions. I stayed right on track. I saw that beautiful woman. I looked away. My wife would be so proud. And then the next day comes. And you're like, ugh, this one wasn't as successful. And we have those days. You know, on a bad day, your body screams and it overwhelms your spirit and it silences your brain and you do stuff that you know is wrong and you know it's potentially dangerous. But you just can't help yourself because the lust of the flesh overwhelmed the logic of the mind and the truth of the spirit. And we just, we get overwhelmed. See, actually, um, talking with my mom this week, she uh, reminded me of something because... Uh, of something I did when I was younger. I shared a story last week of uh, um, using the middle of the road as a bathroom, um, and she laughed at that, and she then reminded me of something else I did, which I got caught in a lie. Now, of course, as a pastor, we don't sin anymore. You understand that? When we get, when we get ordained, they give us this device, actually, that we plant right behind our ear. It's called a sin inhibitor. Anybody got one of those? I'm just kidding. Come on now human like anybody. But I'm going to address that in just a minute. The thing is, when I was younger, I actually, as about eight or nine, went down to the neighbors. We, were in a, we lived in a really nice trailer park. I believe you, you can actually say that. And we went down to the, another house, and we, I ripped open the corner of this shed, got into the shed, opened up the door, took all their storm windows, me and another friend, we took their storm windows out, and we smashed every one of their storm windows. Right? And you're like, I can't go to this church anymore. Uh, <clears throat> smashed all their windows. Well, needless to say, smashing windows is not quiet. The police were called on us. They show up. They're like, where do you live? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Eight or nine years old, I don't know. So he takes my hand, and he starts walking down the street. Unfortunately, my mom was out in the flower bed uh, in front of our trailer house, and she was working, and he comes up Ma'am, do you know who this boy belongs to? <laughs> my mom's, for honest to God, my mom's first reaction was, no, officer, I don't. <laughs> I think she's probably watching right now, so you can ask her later. Fortunately, she did own up, and she did acknowledge that I was her son, but I was in a lot of trouble. I lied and covered it up, and it failed. My mom <laughs> lied and tried to, uh, that she, yeah, I'm thankful for my mom. But, we get caught in these things where, where we lie and we cover up. Men, you know, men especially struggle with, with this, these lusts of the flesh. And, and we make excuses and we justify. So men, it could be something 
lustful that you're looking at or, or engaging mentally in. It could be that married lady who's kind of struggling in her marriage right now, and there's this other guy at work that's so nice. I wish my husband would be like him. And the danger that comes with that. It could be something like overeating. You know you shouldn't eat too much. You come home and you feel kind of depressed and kind of lonely and kind of sad, and that bag of chips is screaming your name. Nobody in here would deal with that, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, some friend probably had that case. But what do you do when you sin? What do you do when you're confronted with these opportunities or even you begin to act on them? What do you do with that? And I truly, because the thing is, I truly believe that we don't have to continue in a habitual cycle of being stuck in sin. Amen? That we can be victorious over sin and the power hold that it has on us. As long as you remain in the flesh, in a body, you will have opportunity. But I do not believe we have to be defeated. And this is where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. See, the lust of the flesh, many times, uh, when, we, when it happens, we're tempted to conceal it. And say, who, who, me? I would never do that. I would never do something like that. <clears throat> because the lusts of the flesh are embarrassing, aren't they? When you realize what you did, you're like, oh, what are people going to think of me if they know what I did? And we begin in this cycle, and it's so easy, but we have a choice to make. So the tempting thing to do is conceal and cover it up. And that's what David did. And he came up with this elaborate plan. He would get Uriah to come back and from, from the front line, from, from the battlefield, and he would uh, have a meeting with him. He would have him stay at his house, at Uriah, go back home to his wife. The goal that would be that he would go home and be intimate with his wife. Nine months later, uh, Bathsheba would have a baby, and, and David would be like, yay, congratulations for you, right? But Uriah, being the man he was, slept outside because he's like, I'm not going to uh, be intimate with my wife while all, while all my fellow soldiers are out there on the field. So that plan A didn't work. So, so he goes to plan B, which was to get Uriah drunk. Well, that didn't work. So plan C was to send Uriah to the front lines to have him killed in battle. He had all these plans. Luke 8, 17, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. See, we have different plans. When, you, when you're concealing something, many of us will think this through. Plan A, I'll just delete the history on my computer. Well, I'll just delete that message that that, per, that other girl sent me. I'll just hide the, the wrappers of candy that I've been eating, or I'll hide the bottles of stuff that I've been drinking or the pills that I've been taking. I'll hide these things. And, and if that doesn't work and, and if somebody kind of catches on, it, well, it's a lie. It wasn't me. I would never do that, right? And we begin to lie about it. And then C, if you get caught, is to deflect the guilt. Well, if you hadn't left that Snickers out, well, if you hadn't neglected me physically, well, if you hadn't neglected me emotionally, and we start to make excuses and pass the guilt. But Numbers 30, 32, 23, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. You can lie to people all day long. You can put on masks all day long. But God sees our heart, and it breaks his heart when we lie and we cover it up. God didn't make us to be, he meant us to be open in relationship with him. And that's where we want you to be. Sin has, always has a way of, of coming out. And maybe you haven't been caught in your sin. Maybe you've been unlucky enough to successfully hide your sin all this time. And I mean unlucky. Because you're stuck. But the beautiful thing is in this story is this prophet named um, Nathan. See, God loved Dan, uh, David so much that he revealed and he exposed. And we read this in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 14. The Lord sent Nathan to David because God loved David. And, 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 da and, and Nathan goes through this, this story of talking about a rich man with sheep and how uh, the rich man didn't want to use his own sheep to host his, uh, this guy for dinner. Instead, he goes to a poor man, takes his only sheep, kills it, serve it serves it to his company. And, uh, and Nathan tells this story to David. And David's irate. How dare this man, this rich man, do this to the poor man? And Nathan looks at him and says, you are that man. And how often do we as Christians, we point the finger, how dare you have that sexual sin? How dare you do that? How dare you tell that lie? How dare you? 
And yet we ourselves are struggling with things too. We're so quick to point. We're so quick to blame. And yet when we would stop concealing and we would start confessing, God has openness. And there's so, how many people, I mean, many of us in this church would know people that don't come to church because of the hypocrisy and the duplicity within church. If we would start being more honest and truthful, how much more would the world be open to hear our message? Amen? So we see this and it plays out. Whoever conceals does not prosper, but whoever renounces and confesses finds mercy. And I would ask you this morning, what are you covering up? What are you trying to hide? God knows. Will you be honest with him so he can bring the healing that you need? Will you allow him to do a work in you? And I would encourage you, on your notes, there's a spot to write that down. Be honest. And if you're sitting here saying, I can't write it down because it's too embarrassing, that should be alarm bells all over the place. If there's a blank on your notes and you're freaking out because you think that you might have to write it down and the person next to you might see, that's alarm bells right there. God, I need to do something about this. See, there's, a, there's two types of confession. Number one, and this is what's so beautiful about the story with David. Okay, first of all is confess to God for forgiveness. Psalm 51, 1, David cries out, and, and, and listen to the repentance of his heart right after he get caught. So we read in, in 2 Samuel 11, his sin. We read in 2 Samuel 12, his exposure. And we read, we read in Psalm 51, his heart's response. And this, I believe, is why he is labeled a man after God's own heart. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a what? Pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Restore the joy. Many times, and many of you in this room know it, when you are concealing and hiding sin, the joy is sucked out of you. Many of you in this room, you once knew a passion and an excitement and you were on fire for God. And you could sense Him with you. And then something happened. Some sin happened in your life and you began to cover it up. You began to hold it back. And it began to cause a barrier between you and God. And this is where when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of that fruit because it's going to cause you to die. Maybe not physically, immediately, but it causes you to begin to spiritually die. And I believe that many of you are, this morning are being called to, re, to, to new life, to be revitalized. That God wants to breathe fresh life into you as you begin to confess and, re, and, and release these things. See, the second thing we do is to confess to people for healing. You get people in your life that can hold you accountable and, and, and that you trust. And we, so we confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to people for healing. James said this in, in James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. I want to be healed. I want to be free. I want to be not burdened down by sin. And this was, hap I've, had, I've had people come up to me and they'll come up and say, you know what, Pastor Amos, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anybody before. And right away in my brain, it's like, okay, we're about to have a breakthrough. Somebody is about to experience a, a, a release in their life. And they'll begin to say what's going on, and their body language will begin to change as they begin to re feel the release of the burden of sin on their life. And to have that out there can feel so good. And there's some of you this morning... Many of you this morning, that there's something in your life and you just need to get it out there. And you need to trust somebody with it. And is it messy? Because some of you will say, well, I can't do it because it gets messy. Yes, it does. Now, I'm not saying stand up here and confess everything. Okay? Because there's some people in this room that probably couldn't handle that. But what I am saying is finding people that you can trust. That can speak into your life. Men surrounding yourself with other men that are wiser and smarter and stronger than you and saying, hey, help me with this and work through it. Because 
And this, is, this point isn't on your thing, but I'm going to say this quick because I think this is really important. We confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to people for healing. But you don't have to stay stuck. Okay? Because when we, when we look at Romans 8, and if you were to turn there and you write this down, we're not going to go through all of it today. But Romans 8, verses 1 through 9, it's, it, it tells us, it says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of, of Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. So it talks about how when we walk according to the Spirit, we begin to have the strength, we begin to have the power to overcome. Now, am I, am I still tempted by sin in my life as a pastor? You bet I am. Am I as susceptible and as weak to it now as I was 10 years ago? No. Because there's little by little, every single day, giving more and more room for the Holy Spirit to grow and strengthen me. And I believe that's what every one of us needed, to be honest with God, be honest with people, and then to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk it out. To not just, you know, we, we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. He's a seal of our salvation. But we want more of the Holy Spirit pouring into us, strengthening us, empowering us to live according to the Spirit and to do His will, not my will. Once again, raising our hands in surrender. God, I'm going to stop doing mine. I'm going to freeze, okay? Now what does He want me to do? Okay, I'm going to start doing this. And Lord, give me a heart to pray and ask forgiveness and to seek reconciliation. Now in just a moment, we're going to have some teens come in here. But before we get there, I believe that many of us this morning are at a crossroads. Many of you this morning are at a decision point because there's something in your life and you've got to make a choice of whether you're going to conceal it or you're going to confess it. In fact, if you had every head bowed and every eye closed, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that brings hope. Father, I pray that we would not continue down this trend that our nation is going down of not only um, hiding sin and not only making excuses for sin, but actually justifying sin. Father, I pray that today we would stop any justification of sin, no matter what it is. And we would come open and honest before you to allow you, your truth, to speak into our lives and your Holy Spirit to bring healing and that you would set us free. So today I pray that every person in this room would have the courage to do what is right and pleasing to God. So right now I would ask you, just put your hand your head bowed, your eyes closed, put your hands on your lap. I don't want to soften this, but those, there's, there's some of you here that you know that there's something in your life that is not right and it needs healing before God. And right now, if you'd be honest before God and say, yes, there's something in my life. I need God to set me free from this. I need to confess it before God. And I need to find somebody that I can confess to. And you say, yes, that's me, Pastor. I, I, need to con- I, I need to be honest before God. There's something in my life that needs to be dealt with. If you just raise your hand right now. From, the, from what you would say, the littlest of issues to the biggest of issues. Everybody in this room struggles at different levels. You're at different phases in this journey. But if you acknowledge and say, yes, there's something that I've been hiding. There's something I need to deal with. God, help me. And I think this would apply to most of us in this room. Thank you for being honest. But I still think that there's some of you, I just know that there's more of you in this room that say, don't don't miss your opportunity right now for healing. Don't miss your opportunity for God to forgive you. Just slip your hand up right now. God, I need your help. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We invite you more specifically than in just building it, but into our hearts. Lord, soften our hearts. Lord, give us the strength. Give us the willingness. Give us the courage to confess to you. God, forgive me for this. God, forgive me for, and then just whatever it is, 
that's on your heart, begin to speak that to the Lord right now. Just begin to speak it out to him. And if, you, if for some reason your hand's not up, just begin to pray for those that are. And I believe that God's going to begin to release you, and release your heart from the burden of that. And he's going to start to give you divine ideas on how to overcome that. How to, how, what steps you can take blocking somebody's phone number that's been a temptation, removing somebody from Facebook uh, who you shouldn't be in a relationship with, uh, uh, getting rid of some device or blocking some device that you've been stumbling on. He's going to give you ideas. Then he's also going to put in your mind somebody that you can trust. And it's going to be hard, but somebody you can confess to and begin that journey of accountability with. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak these things into our heart today and throughout the course of this week as we enter into a time of prayer and fasting over the few, next few days. You can put your hands down because I also believe there's another group in this room that you've never had the release of sin in your life. You've never been uh, at that point where you could take the sin, the sake, take these things that you've done wrong and release them and let them go. And this morning God is saying, I'll take them. I'll forgive you. I want to be your Savior. You've never asked Him he loves you so much, he paid the ultimate price for every one of us. And this morning, he's calling you to say, you can put it down, you don't have to carry it anymore. And he's inviting you to surrender to him. And if you're here this morning and today you'd like to say, I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I want him to take the burden of my sin because I'm sick of carrying it and I need forgiveness. And if you, and I want to make eye contact with you. If you just look at me, raise your hand, and say, I need to ask Jesus Christ to be my personal Lord and Savior. If you just slip your hand up right now, just slip it up and say, yes, that's me, Pastor. I need to ask Jesus to be my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for being honest. Up front here, thank you for being honest. Anybody else that would say, yes, I need to ask Jesus into my heart today? Anybody else this morning? Thank you for being honest in the back. Everybody would stand with me right now. I believe every once in a while we all need to pray this. But specifically, if you raised your hand, we want to make connection with you. Please let us know the decision you're making today. But if everyone would repeat after me, we're going to pray together. and We're going to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives. If you'd repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for freedom. Thank you for truth. Thank you that I don't have to carry my sin. That you love me. You have a plan and a purpose for me. Today I give you my sin. Set me free. Take the burden. Make me a new creation in you. Help me to see things that don't belong. To receive your forgiveness. And to find somebody that I can trust. I receive new life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give a clap offering up to God this morning.